Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior bureaucrat and uh, someone who's doing a lot of things differently, Professor Prajapati Trivedi. Professor Trivedi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Trivedi has been the Commonwealth Secretary General Special Envoy for SDG Implementation. He is the former Secretary to Government of India, responsible for performance management in the Government of India. He is a visiting faculty at Harvard, as well as the IBM Center for the Business of Government. And most recently, he has been appointed as a Distinguished Professor at MDI. So, Professor Trivedi, let's first talk about... Uh, the role that you have played in performance management in government. Uh, when I was reading about you, you say that your commitment to make ministries and government departments accountable and performance driven is unique. So my question to you is, what are the challenges you have seen in seeking accountability? Thank you, Mr. Gert. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted and uh, pleased to be speaking with you. But may I start with a small correction? I'm uh, more of a teacher than a bureaucrat. Okay. I have, Apologies. I, I started. That. Yeah, I started my teaching career in 1974 uh -huh. and continued to teach. Okay. So that's uh, more than 40 years that I've been teaching. Wonderful. And during that time, when I was, whenever I was called to duty, mm -hmm. I served, and I was served both in our own government twice. Mm -hmm. I was economic advisor to the government of India. At that time, I was a chair professor at the Indian Institute of Management. Okay. So I just came from there on leave. And uh, then the second stint was when I was with the World Bank, which is mm -hmm. also an intergovernmental organization. I was serving mm -hmm. there, I think. And I was called to duty by our government in 2009. And mm -hmm. I was delighted and honored to be part of the government. Terrific. So and I have a tremendously optimistic view of the government, mm -hmm. and uh, and I shall talk about the challenges that you mentioned. But mm -hmm. I don't think, as I will try to explain, any one of them is insurmountable. They are all within the reach, and they have been sorted out across the globe. So, so that's why I was called. Okay. So the challenges are, if I close my eyes across mm -hmm. the government, mm -hmm. from Venezuela to Argentina to to you name it, uh, Fiji in the Pacific, to uh -huh. Kenya in, in Africa, the challenges are the same. Uh -huh. And all governments really face two fundamental challenges. One, they have multiple principles. That means everybody thinks they own the government, whether right. it is the Ministry of Finance or the planning unit now in, in our country, the Niti IO, which used uh -huh. to be the planning commission, the Administrative Ministry, the CAG, the Controller and Auditor General, the CVC, which is the Central Vigilance Commission, mm -hmm. and the whole host of organizations, they feel they have a right to supervise the functioning of a government department. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple principles, including mm -hmm. the parliament, of course. But the problem is not multiple principles, because in the private sector, as you know very well, mm -hmm. There are thousands of shareholders, but the difference between the public and the private sector is that all shareholders in the private sector pretty much have the same objective. Most the uh, owners mm -hmm. or the shareholders want that the bottom line, the network, they're all interested in the profit uh, as, a, as a short form of telling what I'm trying to convey. So they're all focused in the same direction. In our case in the government, we have multiple principles, but they all have different objectives. Someone has political, someone has efficiency, someone has effectiveness, and therefore multiple principles with multiple objectives, which are often conflicting, mm -hmm. leave the civil servants completely confused. Mm -hmm. So I found that no matter where you go, they just don't know what the bottom line is in the government. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and as you know, if you do not know the bottom line, uh, you can't really achieve the bottom line. You can't really, if you can't measure That's it, right. you mm -hmm. can't manage it. So that is the fundamental challenge across the globe. It's not just India. Of I course, understand. in India too, we have the same challenges. Sure. But, you know, uh, uh, I've, over the last four and a half decades that I have been working and seeing batchmates and friends in the, in, the, in the civil services, the finest minds in our country 
go into the civil services, you know, after such an amazing competition, etc. Where does the so-called work culture uh, of the government overtake the enthusiasm uh, to perform of these young graduates coming out? Absolutely, you're right. And I let me be totally transparent. My younger brother uh, is an IS officer, uh, who was chairman of Air India at one point. Uh, mm -hmm. And my younger sister is also in the IAS. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law is in the IAS. So I have great affection for them. Absolutely. And, I have, and great admiration for the services because I know they are as good as anyone, if not better, because they've gone through some of the most rigorous examination. Well, I, I would say they are the best. Uh, I, I agree. I completely agree. Having taught recently in Lal Badu Shastri Academy, mm -hmm. I know they are the best. And let's right. not even debate that. I mean, there's no doubt. No, no, that's not done. Stand but, up and debate. Right. At all. Absolutely. So the, your question is what happens? Okay. And that, that is also not surprising. Mm -hmm. It's not my view, mm -hmm. but right from Peter Drucker, the famous management guru, mm -hmm. There is consensus among experts in management that the effectiveness of an organization, the 80% of that effectiveness mm -hmm. depends on the quality of systems and only 20 on the people. Mm -hmm. So it is the systems which determine the effectiveness of, this, of the output or what the performance, if you like. And within that people category of 20%, 80% is attributable to leadership. Mm -hmm. So all you need is a good leader with a great system. Mm -hmm. And believe me, the rank and file would rise to the occasion and surprise you. And it's, it's not surprising to me as an mm -hmm. observer of management literature and a student of history. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Alexander the Great, Ashoka the Great. They were wonderful leaders. I mean, they were leaders who had a great system and the rank and file rose up to conquer the world for them. Mm -hmm. We don't know the names of the rank and file, but we remember these great leaders because they, wherever they went, they were successful. The system performed for them. Sure. And that's all we need. And I have found this to be the case around the world. It's not specific to a country or a place. Fair enough. I won't get into uh, a dialogue on that one because we have a lot of ground to cover. But, you know, when you speak of performance management in government, uh, how would a strong system of performance management benefit the economy? Well, uh, a good question. Thank you, Mr. Gerg, because I worked for the World Bank for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion, I worked there as an economist, which is my basic training. I studied and did everything in economics. I was hired as a senior economist. But I came to the conclusion that, that the competitive and comparative advantage of nations does not depend on resource endowment, which is the traditional economic theory. Today, it depends on the quality of governance. So small countries like Singapore, Ireland, uh, New Zealand are remarkable examples of success, not because they were full of resources, mm. but they had a governance system which gave them the edge. So in terms of economic development, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that it depends on the, quant the quality of governance and hence the government performance management, because that is the means to, attend, to attain uh, effective government. Mm -hmm. So that is the connection between, and I, there are many other examples I can quote, including there is, a, as you know, what used to be called doing business survey by the World Bank, which looked at the investment climate in countries. And guess what was one of the most important indicators in doing business? That was the effectiveness of government. Mm -hmm. So they also measured the effectiveness of government. And that really was also instrumental for creating a good investment climate and hence economic development. So there are many connections like that. Fair enough. So, uh, you know, you were involved in several reforms between 2009 and 2014. Tell me about some of the key initiatives. Well, I was uh, called to duty, uh, to be honest, because two milestones had been achieved. Two landmark reports were presented in 2008. One was the report of 
the second administrative reform commission, which was headed by uh, Mr. Moiley. And then there was the sixth central pay commission report, which was also presented in 1998. Both these reports focused on performance of the government. Mr. Moiley's report said that the essence or the essential element, they had looked around the world and spent, I don't know how many lakhs and crores of rupees to study this mm -hmm. topic. They had ex uh, access to every expert in every country. Mm -hmm. They came to the conclusion that the most effective instrument for turning around the government was something called performance agreement. The, the concept of performance agreement, which was used from New Zealand to United States everywhere and most of the OECD countries, and hence they recommended performance agreement as a tool for improving the performance of government of India. So that was the Administrative Reform Commission. The second landmark report was, as I said, the Central Pay Commission, which recommended that government must immediately implement a performance-related incentive scheme. Now, I'm understating they recommended. In fact, they shouted, they were angry, and the reason why they were angry was that the fourth pay commission in 1987 had recommended the same thing. Mm -hmm. They said, we are increasing your salaries dramatically this time, only on the condition that you will have a performance-related incentive scheme, that you will focus on performance. This is not a gift just like that, because mm -hmm. we believe uh, we are giving the salary to incentivize you to perform. Mm -hmm. Government quickly implemented the rise or the raise in the salary but never cared about implementing performance-related incentive scheme. This time, and as always, in most cases, the head of the Central Pay Commission is a retired Supreme Court judge. This time, it was a brilliant Supreme Court judge who was very angry when he said, each time we recommend, we give you more money, but we say, please have the performance-related incentive scheme you have not done. And so the two reports, major oh. reports in our country, focused on performance of the government. Now, the question was for the government, who is going to do it? How do we do it? Now, it, it's the same thing, heal thyself, doctor. I mean, you know, how do you, does the patient heal itself? So they had uh, seen me as economic advisor to government of India in, in the early 90s when we were doing the memorandum of understanding the similar thing, improving the performance of public enterprises. And so they remembered and they called me. They said, would you be interested in taking up this challenge? And I accepted. And so I came precisely to, to implement the recommendations of these two reports. And were these implemented? They were implemented. Mm -hmm. And if you had asked me in 2009, January, when I joined the government, that how much of this would you be able to implement? I would have been ashamed to say what we were able to achieve. I mean, we, it was beyond my wildest dreams what we were able to achieve. So what you're so, saying is we have a strong performance-driven incentive plan now in the government. We had from 2009 till 2014. Mm -hmm. And that's when I retired. And we had one of the best examples. And today I am in the Commonwealth Secretariat around the world, in the Commonwealth, all I'm implementing the same thing that we did in India around. You know, our neighbors uh, have copied. Bangladesh is far ahead of what India was. Bhutan is far ahead what we were. But alas, in our country, I have no idea why it stopped suddenly. Uh, uh, I don't want to get into yes, a political yes. discussion at so, all. Right. So, but I mean, the fact that you said, yes, it was there, but it came to a grinding halt in 2014. So let's now move to uh, the SDGs. Yes. You know, uh, you have uh, you are the Commonwealth Secretary General Special Envoy for SDG implementation. Tell me about your role. Well, I uh, it is because I was a champion and I uh, studied SDGs because SDGs are not very different. One should not think that SDGs are something unique. As a development economist, I have been studying these things since 1972, since I went to the London School of Economics. I'm a development economist. No idea there is Nobel Prize winning idea. They're very simple. See, the, the MDGs yeah. and the SDGs, I'm, I'm aware of these. Things. Yes, yes. So you know that. that. It's a very right. simple, straight, direction-setting objective. Right. That's so, so therefore, what's the big deal? 
Mm-hmm. The big deal is that they are not being implemented. Mm-hmm. It's not about ideas. It's about right. implementation. So right. therefore, if you see in my title, it is not about SDG in Boy, which is like an ambassador talking about SDGs. In fact, I don't talk to people. Mm-hmm. I say, look, uh, ditto, ditto, you know all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, who, who doesn't know the, that violence against women has to go down? Who doesn't realize that the climate is... Uh, so really- what are the challenges in implementation? The same challenges that I have outlined in government because SDGs cannot be implemented by private sector alone. The the key role is governments. Governments are the ones which signed up to it. They signed to SDGs. It wasn't that the private sector signed, but on behalf of the entire country. So the question is, if governments can't implement, inefficiency is transcendental. It does not affect only health, education, or if it affects, it affects the entire because you don't have a system. So, so my, f- my my question to you then is sure. that if governments, uh, if you are, if, as you say very correctly, that there is no rocket science in the 17 SDGs. Correct. Why are governments not willing to implement them? It's the same reason why they're not willing to do a performance management system. It's the same reason. And, it's, and, and in fact, SDGs uh, add to the multiple principles and multiple objectives because here again, Somebody is telling them you need to do this. So it's one more entity which is saying that in addition to everything, please focus on SDGs. So wherever this has worked, and it has worked, I mean, in the Commonwealth Secretariat, we organize uh, a Commonwealth Award for Excellence in SDG Implementation, not in achieving. We didn't say that how much SDG you have achieved because uh, Norway and Sweden will always be ahead of you because the baseline is so far ahead that they, they can do it. So my question to you, sir, is that, you know, yeah. we've got a very, very young audience. Yes. Who listen to us. I mean, right. 74% of our viewers and listeners are under 34. Wonderful. And we are not, uh, Mike, I'm still not clear what needs to be done. Because if you're going to say that ultimately it's the head of government who's accountable for everything, which theoretically and factually probably is correct. But I mean, everyone is talking of SDG implementation. Right. Uh, my, my question to you is, what are the challenges? If it is that government is not working, then my question is, what can be done to make it happen? Fair enough. So the country is where this is working, and I'll not go into Sweden or Denmark. Mm-hmm. Go to Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. They have implemented an, uh, across the government system, and they call it annual performance agreement. Mm-hmm. Every minister, every secretary to the government signs a performance agreement with the prime minister, honorable prime minister. Uh, and they have integrated SDGs as part of performance agreement. Mm -hmm. So when the person signs, they are signing up to how much of the SDG. So SDG is explicitly as part of their mandate and Mm -hmm. therefore they're achieving it. They are also achieving the rest of the performance. You know, it's not just SDGs. Mm -hmm. SDG can't be isolated from the rest of the government. You can't just say this is, you be excellent in SDG, but be lousy in the rest of the government. So it has to be integrated, number one. Mm -hmm. Second, there must be a system. You will be surprised that when I joined, I found that the annual confidential reports, which are not confidential anymore in the government of India, were not be, uh, for the secretaries to the government of India were not being written because the person who's in charge is the cabinet secretary. He has got so much to do. Do you think he's going to sit down and have a, uh, and write your, so they used to say they are written, but never read. Mm-hmm. And so we changed that. The performance management system for the first time, and uh, I don't know if you have the time. Here is a two-minute clip which you may want to include no, in your. Don't, don't have that uh, in our. Okay, okay. that's fine. But uh, but there is enough uh, material available mm-hmm. uh, for the young people that this is what the solution is, and it large number of countries are using. As I speak, last night I had a conversation with the prime minister's office in Barbados, and they are implementing it. Mm-hmm. So is Maldives. So is, as I said, Bangladesh, Bhutan, large number of countries are doing it. So it's not an undoable task. It's, uh, and it's not rocket science. The basic trick is that you must do what you say. Mm-hmm. Nobody's asking you to promise the, the earth, mm-hmm. but whatever you promise, you must deliver. And in fact, in my view, Effective govern- governance is reducing the gap between promise and delivery. That's good governance. Mm-hmm. If that is zero, you're excellent. 
because we know that poor countries cannot promise and do everything. But the problem is, whatever they promise, they don't do. And that needs to change. And the same thing applies to SDG. SDG is a commitment. Please tell us how much of SDG. You may not be able to do everything. 2030 is the deadline. What you can do this year for various SDGs, and then stick to it and integrate it in a larger whole of government system. Just don't focus on SDG, which right. is separate from your planning. It can't work. Right. Well said. So I've got one more question. Time for just one more question. And that is that, you know, I wanted to ask you on technology. How are you using technology? Or how, can, how are governments using technology either for managing and monitoring performance or even for managing and monitoring implementation of SDGs? Absolutely. In fact, that was the big contribution we had. When we did, we have we developed in the Government of India a system uh, with a dashboard for the prime ministers. So everything was done electronically. The departments inputted what their commitments and they were evaluated and we got a score out of 100 for, for each department, which was presented to the prime ministers. Mm. And we had a system called Results Framework Management System. A version of that now is being used by the Commonwealth Secretariat in the 54 countries. And it is available to countries free of charge uh, because it is a public service. It's a public good, which uh, will be effective only if it is made free of cost. Right. Right. Very interesting. So one last thing, uh, you know, uh, that I wanted to ask you, and that is that, uh, let me come back to uh, the SDGs. Uh, when I was reading about the SDGs, you know, we did speak that it's basically the will of the government. But what is the role that uh, the bureaucracy has to play? in implementation of SDGs because it just flows down, all 17 flow down from government to the private sector, to the social sector, to a whole lot of civil society, et cetera. Right. Where does the role of the bureaucracy come in, in uh, being able to make sure, because we can't ultimately just say that one, one man is responsible for everything in this country. No, that's no one's case. I've never said, in uh -huh. fact, that would be exactly the wrong uh, way to do it. Right. Any such system based on a person uh, goes with the person. Right. So I would not even, hmm. no one's case that it should be. The issue is that accountability trickles down. Mm -hmm. If the top is not held accountable, mm -hmm. then the bottom can't be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And accountability doesn't mean accountability for processes. It means accountability for results. Mm -hmm. That if you do not have an agreement on the results, and that's why it was said the results agreement you need. Mm -hmm. And then because there are 24 hours for the bureaucrats or the civil servants and they have to do many things. Mm -hmm. So all they need is, and you may be wondering what, what it is. And there's two simple things I will mention, which mm -hmm. are the fatal flaws of our current system around the world. I'm not talking about our own dear country, which we have overcome. One is that civil servants are told you have a long list of 15 things to do, for example. At the end of the year, they come back and say, sir, we have done 12 out of 15 things that you wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. But it is possible that the three most important things were not done. So we don't prioritize in government. Mm -hmm. A simple thing like that, prioritizing what you're uh, supposed to do would bring clarity. So simple list is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Other fatal flaw in the way we do our business you know, of holding people accountable is they give single point targets. Mm -hmm. We say you have to build 700 kilometers of road this year. Mm. What if I come to my boss and say, sir, I could only build 655 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Is it good, bad, or ugly? Mm. You don't know because we have no agreement. If the boss likes me, he'll say, Dr. Trivedi, that's close enough. Let's go and have our orange juice. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't like me, he'll say, you know, Dr. Trivedi, you're a good man, but your problem is you'd never achieve targets and mm. can do right anything. So we have to agree on a scale, not on a single point. And these are issues on which the world, at least the management experts have agreed, and this is the way to do it. But alas, uh, it's not being done universally. Wonderful. So on that, that note, Professor Trivedi, thank you very much. It's been such a privilege speaking to you. Thank you for talking to me so extensively about what you have done to improve performance management in government. Thank you for talking to me about what are the challenges of SDG implementation. Thank you again and good luck. Mr. Garg, thank you very much for having me and thank you very much. Happy to speak any other time on this matter. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the brand called You video cast and podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.